Okay, just tell me when you want me to mute the room. Uh, that's mute. All right. Oh, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Okay, Mark, you have the floor. Well, thanks, Jonathan. Well, welcome everybody once again to Lip Balm. It's been a while. Um, we've all been off doing our summer things. Um, I managed in the interim to uh, fracture three ribs and acquire um, the wonderful condition of shingles at the same time, um, <laughs> which turns out it's not as bad as it seems, but um, yeah, it's uh, been a bit of a challenge um, on that on that regard. Besides that, um, we will um, be moving to every week Saturday uh, from around uh, September, uh, August. Uh, we will be having, I think, sh three shows, um, but uh, more about that later. In the meantime, I am delighted tonight to welcome Hank Laser, Jake Marma, Carly Hoffman, and Elizabeth Metzger as our futures. Uh, but before we commence with that, let me first introduce my co-host, Jonathan Penton, uh, who founded Unlikely Stories in 1998, uh, Unlikely Stories, an electronic journal of literature and art. Since then, he's lent his editorial and management um, services to a number of literary and artistic ventures, such as the New Orleans Poetry Festival, Rigorous, and Big Bridge. In 2005, he founded Unlikely Books, which publishes three to five books of poetry a year. He's organized literary performances and performed himself across the United States. His poetry books are Last Chap from Virgin Press, Blood and Salsa and Painting Rust, A Prosthetic Gods and Standards of Saturday from Lit Fest Press in 2016, and the free e-chat book, Backstories, which you can download from Argotist eBooks. Um, yeah, let's see what you got tonight, Jonathan. Thank you, Mark. So as I do most weeks, I'm going to read something that we recently published on Unlikely Stories rather than my own work. Um, I'm not that prolific and this is better anyway. This is called The Shape of Light. It's for Will Alexander and it's by Daniel Siren. And um, I haven't rehearsed it, so but it's gonna be great. I have swam with the mind zeal of Mediterranean opuses. I have meditated on Andean precipices, on finities and infinities of being and seeing. Hidden in plain sight, these realms appear before me untouched by mind, uninhibited by mind, unfractured by mind, unspun by mind. Color and sound of mind vibration and stillness of mind, mind being prescient, sunspot of time, mind being time, mind bending time, mind being, being seedless, motions of planet, catalyst of breath, Mind of universal flickering like a shamanic candle, I burn in the windows of finitude. Like dream bodies of light, I have turned westward, eastward, true north, beneath the vertigo skies. Like dream worlds birthing possibilities, I have evoked with transplanetary eruption. Continents move beneath my soul. My soul moves continents. My soul touches this earth. My soul touches every earth. Fathom and unfathom, transient luminous, I have turned my enemies on themselves. Out of thin air, I have appeared nation to self the ambience of my becoming, like a vaporous light cloud passing within and without mesquite force of thought, of night terrors and swarming vibrations, reflections of connection and deeply rooted tenderness, of time and moonlight's mauvest rays, of Venus flytraps, lighting volcanic ash and watercolor magnolias, uncertain and true. I have lowered the bridge from my heart to pass beyond concussive preaching. I am the cosmos. I am these deserts flourishing within finch wing, untied from the fence. I am 1,000 nights of pinnace, the talisman of darkness. I am palpable reverberations in the hearts of men and women, lion and ringtail, moose and scarab, ant and anteater. Over troubled waters did my soul hover, nights bent to the knees, asking under a canopy of eternity, did my dreams burn with the light of 1,000 eyes watching my every move from present to past, the angle by which this glimpse slips, into the everlasting image, a wind-blown flag in a glass house, governments, nations, borders being tripwires, invisible to the weight of tongues, landscapes, heartbeats, I roam enchanted by worlds yet to become, following the truest, most brilliant light of thought. The poem rests on the mantle of my heart ablaze with solitude, 
The urge to continue, stranger, stranger to humankind, the poem astounds. The gods themselves not at all equipped beyond dream bodies nor ecstatic want and need. The poem ascends to the crown by torch, by touch, the fire of desire, burning in the night sky like a signpost, true north to fatigued travelers, burning in the night sky, shooting stars beyond shadows of consciousness, beyond grief and strange pain do I aim my steps. Target, the other side of the sky. Target, my heart on the cell walls of Buffalo's tears. Target, my heart on precipices of forests forever a rebuttal to governments, nations, borders everywhere. You are fell by the small acts of truth and beauty. Target, my blood flows through the cosmic body in unison with ancient tides revealed at Sun Cygnus. My raising and lowering is the ascension from root to seed to stem and back to soil. My ascension is the orbit of the sun pushed and pulled by invisible forces. My love, the petals of hermetic sunflowers bathed in daylight, plugged by darkness at the right hand of angelic thrones of tears. Destination, freedom from concepts, delusions. Destination, ideas born wings of light. Destination, beyond knowledge, awareness flourishes in puddles of mirrors dispersed throughout the ocean floor. O light of love, O light of creation, take me to the end of rivers, the edge of water and land. On my tongue, circuses of resilience. On my tongue, bouquets of patience. The motion of clouds is my heart's motion. East to west, west to east, from present to past. My heart a candle rejuvenated by sporadic breezes and hummingbirds' wings awakening to the true nature of being. Oh, my heart. Oh, you withering trapeze teetering over abysses of sprawling landmines. Oh, you echo of wing charged eucalyptus swaying. The light of a thousand butterflies make a home in my skull. I dream the dream, the light of flight. I dream the, and command the darknesses. Darkness everywhere, the promise of a beginning. Everywhere, the light of my carcass ignites momentums through the bones, dancing the rain of the tongue's ancient witness. Okay, again, that was The Shape of Light by Daniel Siren. And that's that. And yeah, that, that, that was a mess. Who knows how many times I would have to rehearse that to get that right, but you know, you got the idea. So Cassandra Atherton is not with us today, but we're going to read a poem by her anyway. Uh, Cassandra is an award-winning writer, scholar of prose poetry, and professor of writing and literature in Melbourne, Australia. Her most recent books of prose poetry are Pre-Raphaelite, Leftovers, and Fugitive Letters. She is currently writing a book of prose poetry on the atomic bomb with funding from the Australia Council. I've read it. It's wonderful. Cassandra co-wrote Prose Poetry in Introduction, which I swear I will read, and the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry. She is commissioning editor for Westerly Magazine. Mark, are you going to read Cassandra's poem? Yes, I am. Uh, and this one's called Moon. And it, it's, uh, of course, a prose poem, and it came out in the journal Unbroken. One, the third night we drink too much tequila, and you sleep on the edge of my hair until noon, your body curled around me like a single right parenthesis. I feel your breath on the rounded curve of my shoulder respiration like a steady metronome. This is my happiest hour, three quarters of a king size bed behind us, my toes, a series of ellipses under the sheet. Two, I feel my mistake in the cold tap of invisible fingers down my back, a beating of words on bone and slip of invisible breath in cold air. I imagine you fishing in the moonlight, more owl than pussycat, more Hemingway than Huck Finn. The moon sets in a clumsy enjambment of sky and sea. Green fish with spangled scales leap at your feet. Their dying is a thumping of tails. And that's Moon by Cassandra Atherton. All right, so Mark's going to read his next, and first we're going to read his bio. Mark Vincennes is an Anglo-Swiss American poet, a fiction writer, translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist, and musician. He has published 20 books of poetry, including more recently, Einstein Fledermouse, The Little Book of Earthly Delights, A Brief Conversation with Consciousness, There Might Be a Moon or a Dog, 39 Wonders, and Other Management Issues, forthcoming from Spartan Dival, and The Pearl Diver of um, Arumani? Yes, Arumani. Irumani, forthcoming from White Pine Press. An album of music, ambience, and verse, Left Hand Clapping, is forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincennes is also a prolific translator and has translated from the German, Romanian, and French. 
He has published 10 books of translations, most recently Unexpected Development by award-winning Swiss poets and novelist Claus Mertz, Mertz, and which was a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in Translation. His translation of Mertz's selected poems, An Audible Blue, is forthcoming very soon from White Pine Press. He is currently working on a novel entitled The Age of Occasions. Mark is editor and publisher of Mad Hat Press and publisher of New American Writing. He has lived all over the world, from Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the peak in Hong Kong, but now lives on a farm in rural western Massachusetts, overlooking Herman Melville's Greylog Mountains, where there are more humpback orb weavers, know what those are, sharp-eyed assassin bugs, no idea, and broad-faced sack spiders than people. Mark, a poem? The, thank you, thank you, Jonathan. This is a, a tiny excerpt from my novella, City of Lemons. One in every million, one has a vision. Strange how non-existence complicates your fate. Doors have opened, which were once closed to us both. All these new faces from another era, moving in and out of focus. Do you think they seem more bored than we were? When they ask you, how does it feel to survey eternity? Dark forces from the past creep up. The old bones disintegrate. Somewhere an owl toots. On the far side of a distant field, deer congregate. They sense the magnetic fields, tiny temporal fluctuations, each and every scent. I know they prefer apples over pears. Everything is hyper clean here, not a speck of dust, as my grandmother used to say, brushing her finger along the mantle. Something is lost here, though, something primordial, instinctual, something that can't be learned from the wisest sages. The canines feel it in their teeth, the lambs in their flighty feet. They reach a state of complete conviction in their next meal, no guilt, no remorse, simply eating to eat. I know little of the ocean, probably as much as a field mouse, but I imagine myself within, surrounded by miles and miles of water. Yes, I too have lived once deep within the skin of a planet. Nothing ever seems the same again. True to her word, I'm served my first herbal tea. At first, I think it is mint. Then I realize it must be chamomile. There is no talk of lambs or lemons. Welcome to the city of worms, the woman in plants standing over me said. Previously, they thought it was in the earth, but actually, it was all in the worms. There'll be much to take in, she said. Just bear with us, with me. There was something about the lighting that gave everything a healthy sheen. Blood flowed well through the veins here. That much I knew, sibling. Windows opened up into the most glorious views of wildflowers, mountains and pastures. The grass was lime green and the trees swayed high beyond the line of sight. All that yearning, the plaid woman said. How old are you? I said. 342, she said. How long? I said. We're not sure, the government just opened you guys up. A fair guess would be 800, she said. Out in the tree in the open window, three cardinals were having at it uh, under a cloud of gnats. And hanging in the trees were no lemons, but worms, thousands of them draped over leaves and branches, crawling their way happily toward infinity. Just across the bridge ahead, the plaid woman said, and the four of us galloped in pairs, holding hands as a dachshund galloped toward us, tail wagging. You made the right choice, she said. Furthermore, on the other side, a flock of doves landed on the railing and cooed our abundant welcome. Thank you. And now I am absolutely delighted to introduce Carly Hoffman, who is the author of When There Was Light, forthcoming uh, spring 2023 with Four Way Books, and This Alaska, also from Four Way Books in 2021. Carly is the winner of the NCPA Gold Award in Poetry and a finalist for the Forward Indies Book of the Year Award. Her honors include a, a 92Y Discovery Prize from 92nd Street Y Underberg Poetry Center and a Poets and Writers Amy Award. A poet and translator, her work has been published or is forthcoming in Kenyan Review, 
Los Angeles Review of Books, um, uh, Jewish Currents, Gulf Coast and Boston Review, New England Review and elsewhere. Uh, Carly is originally from Northern New Jersey and earned her FMA, MFA from Columbia University's School of the Arts, where she was the recipient of a Creative Writing Teaching Fellowship, a Philip Guston Endowed Writing Fellowship, and served as poetry editor of Columbia. Carly is the founding editor and editor-in-chief of Small Orange Journal. Check it out, it's a great journal, uh, where she curates and edits the interview series, Small Orange Conversations with Poets. Carly is a lecturer of creative writing at Purchase College SUNY and lives in Brooklyn. Welcome, Carly. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be here uh, uh, to read tonight um, with everybody, um, particularly Elizabeth Metzger, who uh, we were in school together and I have uh, so much love for her and, and her poems and you're just, yeah, this is gonna be great. Um, so I'll just jump right in. I'll, I'm gonna read poems from my, my first book, uh, This Alaska. It doesn't take place in the state of Alaska. It's metaphorical, it's a, a book of elegies. Um, so we'll start, um, we'll start with this one. A postcard from Alaska. The clouds above Barrow swell. Blackbirds squat among telephone wires like stoics. And I have forgotten the procedure of prayer. My hands still my hands. The shape they make, so my mouth warms them. Interchangeable to the scene where I hold a half-dead gull, oil already corroding its nerves. Parts of its skull no longer light up. People too contain a dangerous spill inside them, a transmitter out of date, whole spheres submerged in serotonin. If I can believe in electricity, I can believe the dead still live somewhere. A zip code to a dim, immutable breathing. A voice calling out, this is not the body you longed for. Even the crows who stalk power lines have flown from someplace else. Midnight Sun. When the dawn gulls call, we meet them near the wharf's edge. There is wind, the ferryman gone, quarters scattered along the dock. The sun arrested knobs on hounding light. Our landscape, blonde hills stretch into more blonde hills. Our tongues stunned in observance of white tails in the field. Everywhere unflinching, the public glare of August. Never have we been so involved with our bodies, the risk of them, a sorrow soft and punctual as antlers in bloom. So that's appropriate, it's so hot. <laughs> it feels like it should be August, even though it's still July uh, in New York. Mime in Anchorage Station. There is nothing I can tell you about your death without my hands. My mouth swollen with black leaves, in the creases of my palm, news of a bridge, useful as a weapon, then prayer, then a story where someone does not come home holding flowers, does not pour milk in the cat's metal dish. My hands are capable of chalk and the failure of love to deliver us back to where dark is good. I hold a candle to your face, listen. Winter, when my sisters can't scrub the oil from the thick gold feathers, they clip its wings, untie the cord that binds the slow sheet of its body and plant it into a wooden box drilled with tiny holes. It is my turn to bring the diseased bird to the breeder across the bank, his medicine knives, his hut occupied with feeders and soap. But because I am youngest, because a hunter's moon is how I locate heaven, I take the gull down the wharf, kneel in an untouched tract of snow and quiet its skull with rock. I don't always tell the truth. 
Believe me when I tell you our visions have lost all meaning. This morning, one came like a stone dropped to the bottom of a well. The solution for lightlessness is going down there to climb into the dark like you know what you're looking for. In the same way, I have forgotten entire people. I am just now learning the names for the furniture that separates us. Sometimes sleep is wicked. Sometimes it's a sparrow driving its beak in dirt. Read a New York-ish poem. Riding home on the one train at 5 a.m. Just now, a woman in a yellow dress and matching hairband enters the train holding a plastic microphone. And because at midnight she turned 52, will sing happy birthday through the 11 screeching stops home. Happy birthday to me. She is stomping her suede purple heel as she sways from one end of the car to the other. Happy, happy birthday, even in the elevator as I make my way toward the subway exit, her metal cane tapping against cement like a drumstick. I don't know if she is drunk on gin or some other almost upper that slowly ends in disgust. But that is not my story to tell. Somehow it is autumn. Somehow yesterday I managed to wash my feet. Like you, I don't know if happiness is anything more extravagant than a goal to shape our lives towards, and it's too early for the rest of our lives. And I'll read um, just two more. <clears throat> the Women of Highbridge Park. It's noon on Sunday, and they gather around black milk crates placed in a circle on tattered blue fishing tarps. It's not quite March, but it's one of those fluke hot weather days, and they are so prepared for spring. Swapping old records packed in cardboard cartons, daisies tucked behind their ears, gossiping in the kind of Spanish from the kitchens of my past. Last night at the bar in a flurry of bitterness, I chucked my full beer at the bathroom wall then walked the 30 blocks home. Today, I am thinking about the significance of grass and how I came here because I want to get better at being a person. But every day, I begin to know less about who I am to America. All I know is a small girl emerges from the trees waving a stick, hollers to her mother that the large scrap of rock she's been resting on is lake water, bottle shards scattered across its surface like glittering jagged pieces of a life. I have been trying more each year to be comfortable and maybe a little bit proud of how I've learned to make a home. All this daylight kicking toward the lawn to give what little it owes. And the last poem I'll read is the last poem from the book. Thank you for listening. Overnight, the orchard rinses white with tiny bone until there is nothing left but a wish to drag out mice curled deep in the tunnels and string them from a sycamore. Tonight, the young empty themselves in a football field behind bleachers, their beautiful hands, ribs glossed by stadium light, then slowly, as if still searching for something not there, return to the starry oval of their beds. Who are we, if not images that betray us? The street is quiet. Snow begins in the leaves. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Colleen. Um, and next we hear from Jake Mama, who is a poet, performer, and educator. He's the author of three poetry collections, Cosmic Diaspora from Station Hill, as well as The Neighbor Out of Sound and Jazz Talmud, both from Sheep Meadow Press. He also released the two Claire's Jazz Poetry Records, Purple Tentacles of Thought and Desire, uh, with Cosmic Diaspora Trio, and Homumanic Stomp from Blue Fringe Music 2013. 
Jake is the poetry critic for Tablet Magazine, born in the provincial steppes of Ukraine in a city that was renamed four times in the past 100 years. Jake now lives in the Los Angeles. Welcome, Jake. Thank you, and hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this reading. Um, I do indeed live in Los Angeles, and, and yes, I, I grew up in Ukraine and lived in New York for two decades. And right now I'm in Jerusalem um, on Zoom reading with all of you. So I don't quite know where I even am uh, right now or what. Um, but it seems like the poetry is the mode to be in with all of that. Um, I want to start at the end because the end is what everybody's always thinking about. This poem is called Clarifying Question. When the world ends, will there be enough and for everyone? Or will there be those whose and will be the real high end and, and others who will only taste the end from afar like rented smoke, like the final projection on this one last screen of the sky closing in above all of those who will have nothing to offer the end. And those whose means will mean nothing to the end, those whose end is everyone's and those whose end is a private, gated off, hell of an end. Thank you. Um, you know how on Facebook you get like a thing that says like three years ago, like a reminder type of thing. So I was looking for a poem to read. So this is like exactly from four years ago, um, almost to the day. And um, it's a kind of a poem where you had to be there. And we were all there actually. So it's called Evening Lies. We're all terrible, dark liars. I know it ensconced in July 26, 2018. Why do you think the Senate has not impeached Trump knowing he lied? Because they're all liars, but so are we, all of us, every night. Politicians merely embody lying the way poets embody. What do poets embody? A different kind of lying maybe, the lie of being more manifest than we really are. July 26 is ending. I take out the garbage, dry dishes. You pack kids' lunches and tell me my meditation doesn't do shit. I am still an asshole. We sit hip by tense hip. Tonight, are we poets or politicians? Or maybe that's just not how embodying bodies really work. Um, this is a poem from, <laughs> um, from uh, two years ago. Um, my family and I went on this little road trip vacation north, uh, like far north uh, in California, almost towards the Oregon um, border. And, um, and this is called Love and Aura's Patterns. A year into the pandemic, we drove out on a family trip to a rugged and isolated, beautiful far northern stretch of California called, with good reasons, the Lost Coast. There one morning, we found ourselves on the black sand beach, so named because of the black pebbles, large and small, which covered the beach's surface. I wrote down verbatim observations by my children, Lev and Aura, observations that to me felt like poems, the way a sunset can sometimes feel like a painting. They commented on the black pebbles, or more specifically, the arrangement of rocks on the beach. Lev was nine and Aura was six at the time. Aura's pattern, the rocks put the rocks here. Lev's pattern. I first thought that pebbles were in a random order, but then I started to notice weird oval-like circles. And then I realized the pebbles pattern was people's footsteps. Um, thank you. Um, this is from that same stretch, uh, same vacation trip. It's called the first half. 
My parents squinting all the way from across the ocean point out gray patches in my beard. I refuse to play Monopoly with the kids. Reminds me of life, makes me too nervous. Somewhere ahead above the ocean, fog meets light endlessly, becoming horizon. North California sun, hot and cold both, and the winds rising, but the book stays open on the same page. I'm watching a dot in the ocean, which I suspect is somebody's fin, or maybe nobody's, maybe the ocean's own. No, for sure, a distant being submerged and invisible, imaginary, even if real as if saying, I exist out there in the vast, and so do you, and what shape your fin, what hope above the water, thus the first half of the last day of vacation. Um, so I started writing uh, a book, it's called Skaz, and Skaz is like a Slavic word for this oral storytelling um, written. Um, and written out and sort of like a hybrid thing, like poetry, prose poetry and oral storytelling, et cetera. It's kind of like an anti-memoir. And I started writing it before uh, Russian invasion into Ukraine and um, you know, just continuing to work on it and revising it in the past few months. It's been, uh, an intense process. And um, I want to read you the opening um, of that. Um, the opening piece of that memoir, anti-memoir. Um, and that will be the last piece I read. It's called To Boredom, an invocation. All through the Ukrainian town where I was born, there were these dense wedges of trees and shrubs, shapeless green-gray leftovers of some giant topographic tree feast. We generously called these pasatki, the plantings. You'd be hard pressed to call any of them a park. It was a nothing there, a plop of old world left lying around, half heartedly tended, and not out of respect for something or as a reminder for anything, but just because we needed them or they needed us, and we didn't need to talk about it. These pasadki are where I spend much of my free afternoons and summers in these liminal, tangly, airy spaces that belong to no one and where I too belong to no one but to the direction of my own feet. To me, that's the quintessential Ukrainian province, my childhood's Ukraine. That and a short bus ride to the outskirts where the endless fields of buckwheat are and corn, big kernels, each one as big as a golden tooth. And everywhere on the way, pears, apricots, all kinds of incredible fruit ripening through the summer, which is the only thing that really happens in such provinces as ours was. Yes, the provincial summer. What are you doing today? Nothing. Playing cards with you. Walking around and looking for something that isn't there. Chekhov's nothing with sour cherries on top. When I started writing about the provincial Ukraine I come from, I wondered if it was a boring subject matter, whether my memories are but a teapot, which, as we say, occasionally whistles, but never boils. It is July, 2022, and more than anything ever, boredom is what I wish for, for the provincial Ukraine today. But all there is, is the wall of angst about the country where I was born, the country where my parents and various family members live, the country with mammoth history of my people, Jewish and Slavic both. Boredom, I know now, is the utmost, truest expression of peace. That's why there isn't a god of boredom, nor angel, nor muse. Boredom is messianic. Who is the poet invocation directed towards now, reader? Since my immigration to the US for the swaths of time, decades, I lived under the illusion that every day moved me further and further away from Ukraine with every English word I uttered, with every new face I looked into. Writing about Ukraine now was a way to turn back knowing I existed, and just like every other migrant, I possessed a past that counts as a life and continues to exist in every gesture I make in everything I say. Do I still have the language in my mouth? Enough of it? 
But the war turns such ruminations around real quick, turns you fully backwards, and the world is turning backwards too. Reader, listener, today, Walter Benjamin's angel of history is staring at Ukraine of my childhood. In times of destruction, Jews always liberated their sacred texts and stories first and foremost. I didn't know this is what I was going to be doing writing about provincial Ukraine. The word Ukraine is related to the word Akraina, shared by both Russian and English and, and Ukrainian languages. It means the edge, the border, outskirts, boondocks, Krai, means both the edge and region, and it is pronounced, it sounds a lot like the English word cry, a self-fulfilling prophecy. As for the town where I was born, where my parents still live, it was originally named Yelisevetgrad. It was built by Serena Yelisaveta's behest on the edge of Russian empire to hold off the nomadic tribes, whoever happened to be coming through that way. Like the whole naturalization process in America, you know? Before long, the empire swelled far past its original border and the town became a corner store in the middle of the block as a poet had it. A perpetually self-decontextualizing dot on the map. Is this dot itself not a kind of a migrant? This dot, the spot that isn't marked on most world maps or globes you see spinning around in American libraries in world libraries since the war started all my thoughts begin and end with it with my people who live there oh let there be boredom oh let there be peace and corn reader let there be forever provincial ukrainian corn thank you thank you so much jake really a lot to take in what's going on in the ukraine and russia at the moment um, I guess some of us try and follow it uh, in the New York Times and that sort of thing. Um, but obviously, we have no concept of what it feels like to be so displaced as a nation. Um, my heart goes out to you guys. Next, we hear from Elizabeth Metzger, who is the author of Bed, selected by Mark Bibbins for the Sunken Garden Chapbook Prize, published by Tupelo Press in 2021. Her first book, The Spirit Papers, received the Juniper Prize for Poetry and was published in 2017. And her second full-length collection, Lying In, will be published uh, next year with Milkweed Editions. Her poems have been published in the New Yorker, Paris Review, Poetry Magazine, The Nation, American Poetry Review, and Poem a Day, among other places. She is poetry editor at the LA Review of Books. Welcome, Ed uh, Elizabeth. Thank you, Mark. Um, and Jonathan, thank you both for, for inviting me and including me to be part of Lit Balm. Um, it's, it's an honor to read with you, Jake and, and Carly. Um, very special to, to see you and to hear your poems, which I, I know in my heart, but I, it's always new to hear them again. Um, and Hank, I can't wait to hear you as well. Um, I wanna start actually with a poem by the poet Max Ritvo, who was a, a very dear friend of both Carly and myself. Um, we went to graduate school with him and he passed away in 2016 um, from cancer. So his book, if you have not uh, read him, his book Four Reincarnations and his posthumous collection, which was edited by Louise Glick, um, is called The Final Voicemails. And I highly recommend both of them. Um, I'll start with his poem, Plush Bunny. My poor little future, you could practically fit in a shoebox, like the one I kept Peschel Bunny in when I decided I was too old to sleep with her. I'd put a lid on the box every night. I knew she couldn't breathe. She was stuffed, but I thought she'd like the dark, the quiet. She had eyes. I could see them. They were two stitches. My future has eyes for a while. Then my future has stitches like Peschel's, then cool cotton like her guts. Of course, there is another world, but it is not elsewhere. The eye traps it, so where heaven should be, you see shadows. You start to reek. That's you moving on. Max and I wrote our first books together. Um, we had a very powerful friendship. And um, when he died, um, I started, I continued to write poems, and his voice became very much part of my 
voice. And so I wanted to bring in his real words first before I start reading um, some poems that include him and, and speak to him. Um, this, the five poems I'm going to read today, some of them are in the chapbook bed, which is here, um, but I'm going to read them in on paper if it's not too noisy, because they're also part of my collection coming out called Lying In. And lying in is a term that's usually used to refer to the time period after giving birth, um, a sort of isolated time where you bond with the newborn. For me, that term, that state really speaks to a much larger period of time, both before and after the birth of my child, my children, because um, there, it was very isolating motherhood, of course, the pandemic, but also I, both pregnancies required me to be in, in, on bed rest for many months. So um, this poem does uh, have Max's voice in it, but it is his posthumous voice. So, um, and, it, and it occurs during one of those pregnancies. God face. Once I sat straining to keep you whole when Max said, look up, that high window was made to keep you aware of an exit you can't access, but will be forced through. You will want the exact pain then you would die of now. He said, look down, the mosaic tiles are not just a cold assembly of random glass. They are what God is, individual for each of us, a face designed with all our dead in novel arrangements, friends, ancestors, strangers, even what has not yet lived. So you are here and there still, making up my God face. And if by winter you raise your eyes into this dimension, you will already have renamed the places my body touches through this one room world. Another um, thing I had the opportunity to do in these long bed rest pregnancies was to think a lot about my own childhood. It seemed very uncertain whether there would be, whether I would actually have a, a live child. So instead I found myself thinking back to being a child that felt slightly more real. Um, and in this poem, I thought about the playground, which is a place that is sort of universally somewhere where you only really go if you're with a child or you are a child. And so I could imagine, I could allow my future child to exist there with my past child self. You've been on earth so long already. All my life, all I've wanted was to be myself and someone else, not theirs, but them. My shame about this greed made me hesitant with other children. I wanted what they wanted, but apart. I tried to make it, spooned what I could into shallow mental dishes I stacked all night and poured through my neediest hole, which opens only for medicine or extreme misunderstanding. My teeth browned from too much thirst too late. My eyes bulged from noticing what I wasn't meant to be. There was a playground I went to and can't take you. The first thing I did daily was look for a place to hide or flee. There were plenty of gates and wide enough trees, but I stayed off center, just beyond the sprinkler's range. The others played until they snacked around me. Sometimes they cried, sometimes they looked consoled by what they couldn't have. No, not now. The boundary of things, the boundary of time. I wish this for you. Come soon to be withheld. They were so freely asking for more world. The next poem also thinks about um, my own childhood. I think I was in, I was very isolated. And at the same time um, that I was focused on the pregnancy, I also was, the pregnancies braided together with the loss of Max and also the loss of our dear mentor, um, Lucy, who by some strange magic was the one who introduced uh, me and, and Carly too, to Max. Um, so it was a very unreal and surprising world to be in where I was alone in Los Angeles, a new city I didn't know other than uh, in a room um, and, and with Max and Lucy gone. So I felt closer to the dead in some ways than the living. And that allowed me to really think about the relationship I had always had to others. What are the chances? I go home to my dead try to want less the communion with my closest candle. Forget the fire, I have done fire. I haven't burned anything without planning. There is a man that stays away in me. He has already missed most of my life. He never finds words and is either too old or too young. 
Try to go back to shy smiles, slow appetite, a dress that floats up on a bus through the daydreams of strangers with a lantern, that kind of child. Was it mine, my daydream awareness? Even then it was the awareness that made me more despicable. Some were wrongful, I'm sure. They did want more than to pinch my cheeks and rode the elevator just to find me. And some were caretakers as they claimed, if only I had let them adore me. The next poem um, is an homage to New York in a way. I, I associated the longing I felt after new motherhood, after Max died in this period with a uh, longing for the life I had before. And that, rep that was represented by living in New York, um, lots of energy. And I felt I had to write a poem for my least favorite part of New York, which is um, cockroaches. So this poem is called Roach. <clears throat> the quickness of living, the quickness of wanting to kill something, Forget dreams, they attack me and I welcome their landings as I'd welcome a gas mask filled with all our unsayable thoughts. Kiss me again without being asked or asking if I still love. How to possess an exoskeleton, earth kitchen, shiny brown God's house, guts hollowed. I don't know what marriage means at 2 a.m. with six or seven roaches vying for my mouth and other openings. If someone handed me a microscope, I might wake up. A microphone, I might stop and listen. If you're not breathing on your own by the middle of this lifetime, it isn't worth the privilege of lifting your feet. I made you. I make to lay myself out like a glue trap, safe. The exterminator says they are checking out the new smell of our baby in the holy sliver where our bodies don't touch. I don't think he would hurt them now that he understands them. I don't think you would hurt me, though I've killed you many times either. And the last poem I'll read is um, a sort of love poem. It's a coming back to love after, after being physically and emotionally separated um, for a long time. And this feeling of having, having to acknowledge that we have multiplied or divided or however you see the change of having children. Desire, it is for you I put the children to bed or come, I will keep the house awake for you. The floor is fluttering with tongues. I step through and you step after me, laughing. These are toys. Isn't it obvious how we've changed? I have no more use for pure feeling. You escape directly behind my head. Little vitrines in the closed museums not being looked at. I would die to be their objects. The children left me. You say they came. What could you possibly do for my body? when I am in two separate rooms, breathing. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Woe to be in two separate rooms, breathing. Next, we hear from Hank Laser, who has published 34 books of poetry, including field recordings of Mind in Morning from Blaze Vox, uh, with 15 music poetry tracks, um, with Holland Hobson on banjo, available from Bandcamp and on YouTube. When the Time Comes from Dos Madres Press, uh, COVID-19 Sutras from Lavender Inc., Slowly Becoming Awake, Dos Madres Press, poems that just look like poems from Per, um, and uh, one volume in English and one in French, Evidence of Being Here, Bringing in Havana, Negative Capability Press, Thinking in Jewish from Lavender Inc., uh, Hank has performed jazz poetry improvisations in the U.S. and Cuba with musicians David Williams, Omar Perez, Andrew Rafo Dewar, Holland Hobson, and many others. Uh, Hank's uh, brush mind books have been transformed into video installations and performances in several art gallery venues. In 2015, Hank received Alabama's most prestigious literary prize, the Harper Lee Award for Lifetime Achievement in Literature. To order books uh, and learn about Hank, uh, visit his uh, website, www.hanklaseronword.com. Welcome, Hank. I think you meant to uh, unmute There you go. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's an honor to read with each of you today and, and an honor to be asked to read as part of the Lit Balm series. So greetings to all. 
I'd like to read to you a bit from a forthcoming book. It'll be coming in, coming out in August from uh, Blazebox toward the end of the month. And the book is called Pieces. Let me share screen if I can. We'll see if this will work. Yeah. So this is what the uh, book cover looks like. Um, painting collage pieces by Rich Curtis, who I think is here today. And let me do one other share as well. If I can get this, let's see. Oh, let me see, just one second. There we go, sorry. So this is what the interior of the book looks like. And I'd like to just show you a little bit of that interior as we go along and then we'll abandon it and I'll simply be reading to you. What's odd about the book that you'll see, or, and I think Steve Fredman is with us as well, dedicated the book to Stephen Fredman, a great reader, writer, critic, thinker, friend. The book has an odd beginning. I, um, I write in different notebooks. The notebooks often determine something about the shape and nature of the writing that I do. I'd finished one notebook and was looking around for another and saw this uh, brown leather notebook on one of the shelves here and opened it up and found that the first page had been written by my uncle who passed away a number of years ago, my uncle Stan Goodman, who was a neurosurgeon and a really good biblical scholar as well, and somebody very important to my own development as a writer. I have no recollection of having received or been given this notebook. It simply opens with the initial page of his writing uh, in the year 2000. And I'll just read a little bit of that and then plunge into the book. Uh, May 22nd, 2000, much simpler, same routine to start, dressed informally, no shoes on, again to sun deck, again mid afternoon, 15 minutes mainly praising God. June 6, 2000, 5.45 a.m. awakening. Beautiful early morning sky. I'm restless, anxious, professional problems, ongoing suit. Want to talk to God. Bathrobe on, out to sun deck, and I talk. The magnificence of it all, of creation. The system works in a crazy way. It's even glorious that I'm being sued, that I'm in danger of losing my malpractice insurance. As the sky lightens further, I can see a dizzyingly bunch of purple flowers through a gap in the hedge between the sun deck and the home of George and Marina. I keep praising God audibly. I feel refreshed. How did I get so lucky? And then there is the next moment. From 21 years ago, he gave me this gift of his most intimate words, a blessing and a conversation with God. I have some of her ashes sitting on the writing desk. Her younger brother, and now her, head, heart, hand. Indeed, what more might a page hold? Three brown dogs living in the procession of time. Dancing with integrity and grace, I ask you as I ask myself, simply to listen, and then I'll turn to the book. So open to it, a piece of toast and some granola, all time before and after what I see, what to make of any day. All I knew or know began with this emptiness, with its incessant movement, aggregated singularity. Too few words better than too many. Take some portion of her ashes, make a circle around the cedar tree, is this what being becomes? Once written, I am no longer here. Drive, he said to anyone who would listen. Shake it up, baby, twist and shout, cloud cover. What words return? In this vein, he made up a ritual to communicate with God, wrote one page, and left the rest of this notebook blank. Have a piece of toast with butter or with jam. It simply isn't the same sky from day to day. Light is time. I am up early and right until you awaken. 
Let this be a place for compassion. She lives in memory as do we all until there is no one left who remembers. Certain conditions in which, what could be any better? You are an instance of this world witnessing itself. Attuned to this moment. Why a fly? Why this one invisible buzzing? What does it mean? But really, what do you mean by meaning? What counts? You made it a ritual, minimal music ever present. Say it to yourself, flip the script, which word now breathes through you so gently. What is it? I'm just gonna continue, it's the beginning of the book and I'm just gonna skip around to bits and pieces of the pieces. Door ajar. A door ajar, before and after the word, the word made flesh, the word made fresh, plan it, plan it. Conjure man with his bag of herbs and roots, bottle tree, oh, liberty, what would you be now? Some, if you sing it with care, caring, cares mount, complex of sorrows and pain, worst ever, she says, at 19, when it comes again, as it will, she will be somewhat schooled in it. When I was somewhat young, maybe nine or 10, I beat the new mahogany wall paneling in my room with a belt buckle. Now at 71, I have no idea why. They said it was a temper tantrum. I age as do you, who does not see the finish line? But what to do? what to do about it. Ghost tree, lone tree, and a redwood sense of time. Humans too troubled, too busy for the slowness, syrupy slowness of being here in time. House lived in for 20 years, sold to someone else. What still hangs in air, invisible texture, memory and story, long gone the reasons for anger. Maybe it's what they would have done in the old country. A few Jewish families come over the mountain from San Jose to Capitola to spend a month in the summer in cottages beside the sea. There was the young boy who took care of the injured bird. He had a hawk, but this one was a cormorant, I think. Connected senses making this place now and then. Wait a minute, stunned by red-tipped ice plant in unexpected sunlight, fog comes and goes. Whoever said on little cat's feet got it wrong. Edward Weston, the slow exposure of seeing shape impressing time. To see, to think of it becomes a vow and sustaining practice. Morning opens slowly. They walk in it talking, so are not there then. What is this lilting chatter substance of? He and she dwelled again in that tricky word and turned emptiness into this, without boundary. Meet, meet, busy, organizing it all. It neither arises nor perishes. Receiving and responding again and again until the body becomes ash. A day, a season, and a moment. Let it sink in, shadows and crevices, momentary heaven, tree trunk revealed in this light. Green pepper and the female nude, who I knew not so very well. I met him in 1979 and so began this conversation, now again, years after his death. Which words in simple combination, circle of redwoods, ground cover of ferns, all in dappled afternoon light. Laughing loudly in their tattered fashionable clothes, drinking a cold this or that, anxious at the edge of being. Joy takes you by surprise. Maybe it is all one thing. It hurts to live like this. And it will hurt more not to. Each and every shall have a say. Thinking is the real 
dancing its way inward. Say what? Gold coins, jewels, gems, easy to carry with you when it's time to flee. She sewed, she sewed one gold coin into the hem of her dress. How did we become this? As if they were aware of their awareness. Did they marvel at it? What I want to know is, back again, to when or so memory says up and back down the hillside. There was laughter and applause, trees, hillside, pasture, greater by far than any human invention. The echocardiogram says whoosh, a sound happening within this body, not mine, not intended. Whoosh. What are you waiting for? Was it an emptying sound? That's another story. This is the life. There will always be sentient beings all around, countless past, present, and future in endless circulation. To be with him in tenderness and compassion as he finishes this seizure, I have him drink some water, and in the pre-dawn darkness, we go outside. Soon it will be the day, oops, soon it will be the day of Buddha's awakening, 528 BC. And tomorrow marks the 50th anniversary of the death of Suzuki Roshi. I was not asleep. It happened in the waking world. One question and then another. Sitting, being of the space within which questions arise. Though studied and discussed as nouns, being and time turn out to be verbs. Holding still, I witness their unfolding, which is what I am doing too clarity of mind, seeing itself changing. No hot water if the pilot light goes out. Logic of the form by its own lights leads to concision. To take pleasure in, but there is no taking. You are an occasion and a place. When will you begin your travels to the east? Did you see what I just saw? By sitting still, she was performing the perfection of this moment. Dis and tangle stars and cells interior bacteria and the arising of thoughts oh incarnate host he asked that i listen and i asked the same save by the acclaim of one so it was as ever is hissing sibilance with open lips singing as the year winds down i am quite simply a question, and it is not so simple as this question holds many questions. What is this being incarnate and ever changing into what? Can you let into your life something that has nothing to do with results? Can a fragment be thought of as it so happens, the one who does sit with what arises knowing it is not yours. Come what may, this is what we say, in fits and starts, morning turning from sunshine to cloud cover, a front is on the way, or so they say. Whose mind is this? I am here once with you. Once with you, I am here. It happened this morning. Tomorrow, something else will happen. He was, as some are, a fine and cranky poet who lived far away, perhaps in Kyoto, and for a living he sold ice cream. There are many ways now to live in a cave and stare at a wall. No matter what he said about the disappearance of the ego and sacred Eastern texts, this young one's energy and judgments were out of control. I have more than enough teachers, and so do you, some living, some dead. He carried with him a sacred text from place to place, reading it aloud, seeing who might take it to heart. No one knows what happened to the missing page. His daughter was the one playing Beatles songs at the farmer's market. Stories expand and contract, just like breathing. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Hank. Well, thank all of you. <clears throat> I mean, what a show tonight, right? Started off with Carly, followed by Elizabeth, then Jake, uh, sorry, followed by Jake, then Elizabeth, then Hank. Um, well, I think we need to dream on this a little bit. Um, thank you so much, guys. It's been wonderful. And now I'm going to hand off to my old friend, Jonathan Penton, for the open mic section of the show. All right. Thank you, Mark. Uh, let's see. We have five people in open mic tonight. It filled up pretty quickly. So if you'd like to be on, um, please come join us next time. So we've got a full open mic tonight. Let's see here. We're going to start with Mark Ducharme, who's going to read from his forthcoming Unlikely book here, which is also a place which we plan to release next month. Mark. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I'm going to read uh, uh, something from this book. And uh, I don't know about where you live, but uh, where I live, it's been pretty hot uh, the past um, couple weeks, at least. So uh, this is sort of a poem about the heat. In the heat, which drinks up all your breath, which decimates horizons and drenches your dry tongue while shadows flee this complicating mirth. Heat is vested in the scorch of the primitive in body, which is source of its own fire, even at light's ascendancy in pale hours, we are held by reckless birth. Go in heat then to be hidden in a primitive tree, a collage of stifled dust. In this place dripping with wildness, here you will sacrifice your tongue in order to see or surrender like the scars rippling across your muscles which sear you, scare you, leave you burned and burn the very poem into flesh astride the hungry daylit world. Thank you very much. Wonderful, Mark, thank you so much. It was great to hear in your voice. All right, next up is Mr. Wombat himself, John Wesick. John, what are you reading for us today? Well, uh, as you know, I've uh, just moved to Manchester, New Hampshire. So here is a poem about moving. My living room, a maze of moving boxes, inside textbooks, lecture notes, college transcripts, PhD thesis, blue and gold doctoral hood, recommendations from dead professors, oscilloscope, Geiger counter, long out of calibration, wrist splints and 30% workers' comp disability, three $300 test standard plaque from a canceled defense project security clearance review after I had too much fun in Amsterdam. Chef's knives, pizza peel, decade old Sichuan flour pepper, three old passports, canned clams that expired five years ago, coffee grinder, mocha pot, photo albums, travel brochures, landline telephone tent I slept in on the Olympic Peninsula address of a woman named Zoe four bookshelves two black belts list of attendees from Boulder Aikido summer camp VH8 tapes of Tatsuo Shimabuku and George Ledyard doing martial arts lifetime membership to Don Shaplin Zishin Ryu karate wooden swords torn hakama geese that no longer fit going away card from my Aiki Jitsu teacher, meditation, Banjorioki bowls, picture of me with a black eye taking Jukai in 1985, inquiries about Buddhist groups in Texas, Dharma talks I gave, Zen Center bylaws, my resignation is bored, president, six self-published novels, stories too controversial to read, record of every poem I submitted since 1997, sunk cost fallacies of past glory. 
Wonderful, John. Thank you. What a, what a great night we're having. Thank you so much. Um, next up is Michael Folds. Uh, Michael, what have you got for us tonight? I have a poem called, well, first of all, it's a great reading tonight. And I really liked about everything that I heard. Um, I'm going to read, uh, I travel a lot for business. And, um, and I occasionally use Siri for uh, taking notes. So this poem is called Siri, Take a Note. Siri, take a note. What would you like it to say? Cattails and burdocks in a rising sun. Siri, take a note. What would you like it to say? Under sheets of rain and endless sleep, the wind came in and invited guests and put the day to rest. Downspouts poured what rivers can't, their streams of leaves overflowing. I bent my ear to confirm the news and thunder answered back. Thank the sky, the sky, the sky, lightning and its crack. That fragmentary moment when bellies above growl with anger to be free and to be fed. That's it, thank you very much. Very cool, Mike, thank you. Sure. Okay, coming from um, what Cassandra would call his famous kitchen, we have Bob Heeman, Bob? Okay, uh, this is a piece called Additional Instructions. Look to see who raises the shade. Follow the stream to its source. Use the word thus as frequently as possible. Count the boats that are left in the harbor. Hide the gun before the vicar arrives. Mend the flags that had been bur buried. Allow your hands to explore the tree. Ask the woman to explain her wounds. Learn how the motor should be used. Always leave the lights on. Very cool as always, Bob, thank you. Thanks. Rob Bremner uh, signed up, but I don't see him in the room. He has connection problems sometimes, I know. Um, Brimner, if you're here and I'm just not seeing you, please chime up now. Otherwise, I believe we will go ahead and turn it back over to Mark. Mark? Yeah. Well, what a show tonight. I mean, um, some of the best reading was we've had Ella lip balm from Elizabeth, Jake, Carly, and, and Hank. Um, a great open mic. And also, um, and this is a hat off to Elizabeth for Max Ritvo, who I also think was a great poet. I'm gonna read a poem of his called Dawn of Man. After the cocoon, I was in a human body instead of a butterfly's. All along my back, it was great pain. I groped to my feet where I felt wings behind me, trying to tilt my back. They succeeded in doing so after a day of exertion. I call that time overwhelmed with the ghosts of my wings, sleep. My thoughts remained those of a caterpillar. I took pleasure in climbing trees. I snuck food into all my pains. My mouth produced language, which I attempted to spin over myself and rip through happier and healthier. I do this every few minutes. I think to myself, what made me such a failure? It's all a little touchingly pathetic to live like this, a grown creature telling ghost stories, staring at pictures paralyzed for hours, and even over dinner or in bed, still hearing the stories, seeing the pictures, an undertow sucking me back into myself. I'm told to set myself goals, but my mind doesn't work that way. I instead have wishes for myself. Wishes aren't afraid to take on their own color in life. Like a boy who takes a razor from a high cabinet, puffs out his cheeks and strips them bloody. By Matt, Max Ritvo from his book, Four Reincarnations, which came out with Milkweed in 2016. Um, thank you everybody for an absolutely wonderful night. Um, I wish you all 
love, health, happiness, and poetry. And uh, hope to see you on the flip side. Thank you so much. Good night, guys. That was amazing, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to all.